Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks so much for joining me. I have a terrific guest and a great topic today. With me is Annalie Kruger. I'm going to let her introduce herself and tell you all about her. But we're going to be talking about caregiver burnout and why we need better planning for our aging future. So thanks for joining me, Annalie. Excellent. Thank you, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna Lee Kruger. I am the owner of Care Right Incorporated. Um, I'm happy to be here today talking about caregiver burnout and how we can actually reduce it, alleviate it, and actually prevent it if we have an aging plan ahead of time. So one of the things I wanted to talk about is uh, why I started Care Right, because it affects every single listener that you have and beyond. Like every, this aging, caregiving, dementia affects every household across the world. So, so everybody just kind of sit back and, and listen and hopefully you'll get a few nuggets that can help you as, as caregivers and families have the best successful aging, caregiving, and dementia progression journey. So, so I used to be a social worker and Um, admissions coordinator, and then eventually executive director in continuing care retirement communities, the facilities that have all of the different levels of care. And part of my job was always to do the tours. And it was pretty much always the adult kids who would come in because mom's in the hospital. She's the primary caregiver to dad with dementia. And mom had a stroke and and the hospital says, here's a list of facilities. Go find one by noon tomorrow because we're going to discharge your mom. And now rewind, because rewind, this is 30 years ago when I first started. So back then, families lived near each other. So the kids could, they were more involved, they were more attentive, you know, because they could be. And they seemed to work more as a team because they were all local to each other. And they got together and they had relationships with each other. And so they could like manage dad while mom was in the hospital, you know, recovering from the stroke. But the adult kids, you know, they would come in this whole handful of brochures and pamphlets that the hospital gave them on all these different facilities. And the tour would only take about an hour. You know, here's the bathroom, here's the therapy room, and <laughs> here's where your mom's going to eat. You know, it's kind of <laughs> it's plain and simple. Um, but they had so many questions. And, you know, they they didn't know what questions to ask during the tour. They didn't know what to look for. And then just stepping into the rehab facility or the nursing home, whatever level of care it is that I was doing the tour, you know, unless you hang out in a nursing home, it's a very different environment as soon as you step in and you see like the line of wheelchairs and people just kind of watching TV and a lot of people sleeping and noises and unusual sounds. And so just the environment alone kind of set people back. And so, you know, I, the tour would take an hour and then I was spending literally two and three hours at a time with each family because they had so many questions and I had to fill out my like tour form. So my questions were, you know, does your loved one have a living will, a power of attorney? What's the code status resuscitate or do not resuscitate? Is there a funeral home in, you know, is there already a burial fund, all of that kind of stuff? And the answers were always, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> we never talked about stuff like that. You know, nine times out of 10, it was like, I don't know. We never talked about stuff like this. This just kind of got thrust upon me. And I I have no idea what we're doing. We're overwhelmed. And then family dynamics <laughs> always bubble up, you know, because it's not like this all brings families together like you would hope. And so... <clears throat> And then there was like this many, like a teeny tiny amount of adult kids who would say, you know, Anna Lee, we saw the writing on the wall with mom and dad because we we could tell dad's dementia was progressing. We could tell mom was getting burned out. We tried to get ahead of this and like sit mom down and, and have some conversations about what do you have in place? What are your goals? How can we help you? You know, the kids were trying to proactively like sort all this out because they're like, this is mom's fifth hospital stay in two years. You know, we've been trying to like, <laughs> mom, like th- we're heading in the wrong direction here. We need to start talking about it. And mom gave us so much pushback that we quit trying. So in 2011, I left corporate America because I knew I could just make a better, more 
impactful impact <laughs> on society if I was not under the corporate constraints of Anna Lee, you're spending too much time with these families. Because that's what that's what I was getting written up for. Was spending too much time. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, corporate America for healthcare. <laughs> Yay. Oh yeah, that's a whole other podcast. Not <laughs> even a whole, whole episode. <laughs> That is a whole nother podcast. And so um, anyway, so I left corporate America and started Care Rights Incorporated in 2011 with a whole mission of helping to reach these families all across the world proactively and say, anyone who has aging parents, we need to talk because we know that as we get older, we don't get healthier. We don't get more brain power. We don't get more mobile. And we know that 58% of adult kids will end up thrust into the role of family caregiving, usually without ever having any kind of what wins conversations, right? We've all been there. I've been in there. I've been in there. But the difference is I had an aging plan. <laughs> so so my mission when I opened Care Right Incorporated in 2011 was to reach families proactively so that we could start talking about the what wins. What does dementia look like? What's dementia progression? How do we manage the changes in their mood, behavior, personality, care needs, ability to communicate? How do we handle our changing family dynamics? You know, and in 2011, families were already moving across the country from each other. So the days of having your kids right down the street from you are long gone. So I went virtual right away. It's just back then we just had Skype. And so I had all these families that were like, because I started my company in the Milwaukee market and they're like, oh, I don't want to have to fly back to Milwaukee. I just got back home, you know, because I've had to fly back and forth every time mom or dad have an issue and it just, it gets expensive and inconvenient. And so I was like, well, you don't have to fly back because we leverage technology. Let's work smarter, not harder. And they're like, oh, you would do that? And I said, well, of course. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it, it turns out I was a pioneer in that <laughs> working virtually before we were forced into it. But we, facil we facilitate family meetings and find out, you know, what's working well, what's not working well. We go around Robin. So everybody has a chance to vocalize what, what their opinions and perspectives are. And I talk to mom and dad or my team, and I talk to the parents um, privately as well so that they can talk openly about what they think is going well and what concerns they have. And that way, everybody has a voice that's heard. And then we just we provide a lot of education because unfortunately, when most families come to us um, just completely ill-informed and you can't make smart decisions off of wrong information. So for example... Most families will use Medicare and Medicaid interchangeably as if it's the same program. You and I know that it is so not the same program. They'll say things like, you know, assisted living and nursing home as if it's the same type of care. And it's not at all. It's completely different. And so, unfortunately, we have to spend a fair amount of time just educating them and helping them understand what their care options are. Based on the landscape of healthcare, a lot of families don't realize that you can't just get into whatever facility that you want to. You have to financially, your parent has to financially qualify. They have to physically qualify. They have to cognitively qualify and behaviorally qualify. So if dad is too frail, he's not because he stayed at home too long. He's not going to be able to qualify for assisted living. He's only going to qualify physically for you know, the nursing home. And so we just, we have to go through a lot of information like that. So families understand, so then they can make informed decisions. So we, we help them outline what care options are, what's home care, how much does it cost? And we put all this together in a spreadsheet and a report for them in their area. So we do about 35 family, what we call care matrices and family meetings a week with families all across the country. We teach them about what are the differences in care levels? What's the difference between independent living and assisted living? What's the cost difference? How sick can you be and still stay in this level of care before you have to go into that one? What if you're an out of state or out of town caregiver and dad takes ill? Like, what's your plan? And so that's why we put all these planning pieces together. And we help them understand why it's important to start touring these care facilities so that they are on the waiting list of two or three different care communities ahead of time so that when things fall apart at home or they can't afford home care anymore at $20,000, $25,000 a month, because families don't realize it's that expensive, 
So when they realize they can't afford that anymore or they can't find the quality trained healthcare workers that show up for their shift, then at least their loved one is already on the waiting list of two or three different care communities that they've toured several times. They We, we gather the state survey. Do they allow cameras? Do they allow your pet <laughs> to come in? You know, so we we outline all of these different options for them. And that way they know how to tour the communities with 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 confidence because we provide a whole checklist of what questions to ask and what to look for. We know that unfortunately, a lot of seniors and vulnerable adults in these care communities are not properly taken care of. There's a 2020 study that was done um, that indicates that two out of three nursing home CNAs admit to abusing and neglecting their residents. And so we have a patient advocacy division um, and I can tell you that number is much, much higher. <clears throat> That's so, not a good number. <laughs> no. And so we teach, we teach families, you know, cause we have basically done for you aging planning and done for you projects or do it yourself. And so if the family is going to embark on being their loved one's patient advocate, there's an eight page, basically checklist that we provide them and go over with them because there's just there's so much that you have to be watchful for when you do have a vulnerable adult to make sure that they're getting properly taken care of with the healthcare workers that we have today. And then we also go through the grab and go binder with them, which is an organiza document organizational tool that I created. Because again, when I was still an employee, these adult kids had no idea what their parents had in order. And it's like, how can you be the financial power? How can you name somebody the financial power of attorney and then not give that child the information they need to be able to do their job? You know, the accounts, passwords, who's your financial advisor? None of these kids know the answers to that. And so and the, the only it, reason we knew who my dad's financial planner was is because he was a family friend. Yeah. Yeah. Almost, you know, almost all of my clients, when I ask them, when we're working on the grab and go binder, and when I ask them, who was your parent's financial advisor? Since I started my company in 2011, and this is 2023, there's only been like two kids, two adult kids, separate families who are like, oh yeah, my parent's financial advisor is Bob Smith. You know, they, they actually, so, so I have a whole nother company where I train financial planners about how to do a better job of financial planning. <laughs> That's a good idea. Um, but that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother thing. But anyway, um, so yeah, we, we help them with aging planning. The reality is, even though I embarked on Care Right with the mission of helping families plan ahead, the reality is 92% of our clients come to us in total crisis mode and overwhelm. They're burned out caregivers. You know, they're like most people. We don't act until we're forced into it. You know, we don't lose weight until we have that first stroke or our cholesterol is nine bazillion. <laughs> you know, it's just human nature. We don't we don't tend to proactively take care of things ahead of time. So 92 percent of our families come to us in total crisis mode, overwhelm, caregiver burnout. Family dynamics are really, really sideways um, in every single way. And families have no idea what to expect with dementia, with chronic diseases. Um, you know, they're they're really coming to us in a bad way, and and a lot of that is just shame on the healthcare industry. You know, the healthcare industry gives families these like major diagnoses of Parkinson's or dementia, and then it's like good luck to you. You know, but that's where we come in as as consultants to help then we take them by the hand and then help them navigate care decisions, care options, make sure that they have everything buttoned up and and they have access to our trusted network of professionals for them to make sure that they get that grab and go binder, you know, done and their legal documents in order and insurance taken care of and all that kind of stuff. But that led me to, you know, I've had, you know, trying to reach, you know, there's over 300 million family caregivers worldwide. And so I'm like, okay, that's great. But my team and I can only reach so many, <laughs> you know, before we, before we add on to the team again. And so, um, because we also do, like I said, patient advocacy, care coordination, care management, and we do all of this virtually so that adult kids can just be the kids again. 
Because if you've ever had to coordinate mom and dad's care, it can take 10, 15, 20 hours a week. And it all has to be done during business hours because that's when doctors are available, right? <laughs> and home care companies. So families can't keep, you know, sacrificing their careers and their jobs and their and upward movement in their careers by family care by the because of family caregiving. So I've had thousands of families say, oh, I love my parents because we do. Mom and dad's goals want to age in place at home and they don't want to be a burden to their kids. Yep. <laughs> but it's always the adult kids who are calling Care Right Incorporated for their 30 minute free consult to say, oh, my gosh, I'm in over my head. I, I can't do this any longer. I'm doing this by myself. My siblings aren't helping or my spouse isn't supportive or I'm going to lose my job if I don't get back to work. You know, and they're like, I wish that there was just a way that we could. I wish there was more material out there for us to learn from. So like a training manual for what to do with mom and dad. And so I wrote one <laughs> um, three years ago. It's called The Invisible Patient, The Emotional, Financial and Physical Toll on Family Caregivers. And the reason I wrote this is because that way, I mean, it's jam packed. And I know some of your people are going to be listening instead of watching this, but it's literally jam packed with bullets, <laughs> checklists, scripts, um, tips on how to be a caregiver and survive, what is an aging plan, how to create your own aging plan, how to interview home care companies, how to broach these topics with your aging parents. Or if you're the mom and dad and you're like, I want to have these conversations with my kids, there's a chapter in there on like, how do I talk to my kids about this without freaking them out? <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, and then like, what are the components to a grab and go binder in case they want to do all of that yourself? And then so that's that's why I wrote the book is to try to reach the the family caregivers out there that may not see the value or you know may not want to work together quite yet because they think they have more time or mom and dad are doing fine and I'm like that's the best time to put the plan together because yeah. you're all getting along <laughs> and you're going to have the best quality of care possible when you plan ahead instead of waiting until the chips fall and the house cards falls and then get left with whatever care options are available at that time. And that's, they're not going to be good ones. I can promise you that. So that's kind of what we went through. My dad had diabetes. He had a kidney transplant at in 29 or 2009. We never, ever discussed what would happen if dad went first. Dad just assumed my mom would come live with me. <laughs> thanks for having That's that conversation with me <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and it was like um i'm sorry but no um you know i love my mom but no and when he was in he ended up in the hospital for a month my mom was either at my house my sister's house or my aunt would take care of mom you know her sister at my parents house and when my mom was with me it was so obvious that she had no respect for me as head of the household or somebody in charge, you know, because I she's and I I have to I don't think she I don't I think in my home she might have recognized me as her daughter, but I knew she didn't recognize me as her daughter most of the time. I'd lost a tremendous amount of weight, so I didn't even look like the same person that she might have remembered. So yeah. when I confirmed she didn't remember who I was, the relationship it wasn't a shock or, you know, I didn't, I didn't go through that painful times like a lot of people have, but it was just like, no, like yeah. th at the end of a week, one or both of us will be dead because like, no, I don't want to do this. Well, and unfortunately, a lot of people make knee jerk reactions and move their parent in with them. It ends up working until it doesn't. <laughs> you know, because people don't realize, well, yeah, it's fine. If you guys get along, that's fine. But it's even the no, most close knit family relationships, it will put a wedge in it. Mm -hmm. um, here's the thing. It can seem manageable when mom is still golfing or playing tennis and she can drive and she can toilet herself and she bathe herself. But, and this is what we talk about with families during these family meetings so that they understand what aging in place really looks like, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, once your house starts looking and smelling like a nursing home and the care exceeds what you're able to emotionally and physically and financially provide for them, then there's so many adult kids out there just, they feel stuck because they committed to taking care of mom and dad in their home 
but now all they do is feel angry and resentful and bitter. And so that's why it's like, here's, here are some tips on before you move your loved one in, you have to have an exit plan and exit strategy and say, look, this is going to work until I have to start missing work or until any of my kids, you know, because a lot of them are sandwich generations <laughs> until my kids feel like I, they can't run around and play and be kids anymore. Or until my spouse says, look, I love your parents, but this isn't working. You know, so you have to have like clear expectations and who's going to pay for what? And are your siblings going to help out? Otherwise, if there's no like conversation and plan and written down, then it's, it's just not going to work. So that makes a lot of sense. I had a past guest who actually married her husband after his diagnosis of Parkinson's. And even saying that now I've read her book. I know the, you know, the rationale behind it. I mean, she loved him. It still makes me think, are you nuts? <laughs> but what they did while he was still cognitively able is they, I don't, I'm not sure it was an, you know, an aging plan, but he expressed his concerns, his fears and his desires. And like, this is how I envision being cared for when I need more care. And she kind of said the same thing. So they kind of made a plan together, which she firmly believes made it easier for him to accept, even as his mind was, you know, you know, he wasn't remembering things, but somehow that that bond of, you know, deciding together how they were going to deal with things kind of stuck. And yeah. I think that's just fantastic. And I like, obviously think everybody should be doing that. But, yeah. and then I also have another past guest who took care of his mom. He has Parkinson's. He took care of his mom for five years and he got to the point where like, we're just two, you know, senior citizens on social security and Medicare and, you know, she was 95 and he's like, at what point does this end? And he just got to the point where all of his coping techniques were no uh -huh. longer working. And he's like, I got to take a step back. And it wasn't an easy decision. And, you know, his mom lived in Palo Alto, California. If you guys don't know anything about that, I'm sure a uh, porta potty is a million dollars. Yeah. You know, they had means to... You know, he had, you know, pretty decent retirement income. She had money from their house. He took out equity and, you know, there was a lot of decisions, but it still was a lot of juggling to have the care and, you know, and it's just, it's so hard to say, you know, like my mom always said, I don't want to be a burden to you girls, mm -hmm. but I want to live in my home forever. I'm like, well, thanks yep. for that. Those are mutually exclusive, honey, because you can't live in your home by yourself and I'm not moving in with you. And dad just died and my daughter just moved out finally at 25. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not particularly interested in, you know, like I'm ready for the next chapter of my life and, and you moving in with me is not the next chapter. So mo yeah. most of my listeners know that I did not have a checklist or questions to ask, nor did I do any kind of research on the care home that I put mom in. They said she could keep her dog and I practically flung the checkbook at them. Uh -huh. <laughs> now thankfully they were fantastic um all the same types of criticisms you know i don't think anybody that worked there made enough money from the executive yeah. director down to the care staff i know the care staff didn't make enough money um and it became really obvious how to work that i had to work with them so they could work with me and i was the captain mom's care team and that all yeah. worked really well i was you know i was not the client my mother was. Yeah. And I think a lot of family members don't, they don't realize that they just, I'm, I think it's because most of us are not upper management type mm -hmm. people. And so when we get into that situation, we don't know how to handle it so well. So how would you yeah. go about if, well, let's, let's start with our loved ones haven't put a care aging plan in place. They're saying stupid things like, I don't want to be a burden, but I want to live here forever. <laughs> how do you how do you help families kind of take a step back and start thinking about all the stuff that you listed? You know, what does aging in place look like? What's your exit strategy? Who's going to pay? All those questions that maybe should have been answered a decade earlier. How do you kind of get them caught up so that they're they're not drowning? Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. 
when I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. The two most frequency asked questions is aging planning sounds great. When is the time to do it right now? And the reason is because all the people that had major strokes last Thursday didn't wake up thinking, oh, I think I'm going to have a major stroke today and put my whole financial and family life in turmoil, <laughs> you know, with a bunch of question marks on, okay, what is our new baseline? What's our new normal? And can dad come back home again? Or is he going to be stuck in a nursing home at 16 grand a month? You know, cause that's the reality. So, so <clears throat> how to get mom and cause it, like I said, it is almost always 99.999% of the time that it's the kids that are calling care, right? Cause they've heard me on a podcast. They've heard me present or it's all word of mouth referrals or it's from my book, you know? And so they're like, they're sold on the 30 minute consult. They're like, yeah, whatever it costs it is. Because reality is most of the adult daughters, the year before they hire us for an aging plan, or if they waited until crisis, they're spending 15 grand, they're 15,000 just in the year prior, just an airfare. That's not car rentals. That's not the angst of when you get that phone call again, or having to miss work or having to line up your own child care or care for a spouse who's sick. That's just airfare. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, how you broach this topic with your parents, and I'm not sure who's more your audience, if it's the moms and the dads or the adult kids, or it's just kind of mixed, but yeah, I figured and kind of mine is too. And so if you are, you know, wanting to approach these topics with your, with your parents, you can say, mom and dad, I love you. Speak from the heart. I love you, but we're in uncharted territory. We don't know what we don't know. We can't just wing this and hope for the best. And I want you to have the best quality of care possible. You know, so is it, you know, we need to hire, we need to hire someone that can help us navigate this. It's too much of a learning curve. Your neighbor, Joe, down the street, his input's not going to be helpful because his input, his situation is totally different than yours. And Google will only get you so far. So one way is speak from the heart. Mom and dad, we love you, but we're in uncharted territory. We need help navigating the what wins of aging, dementia, care options, end of life, what what's patient advocacy? Why do we need it? You know, so so hiring someone to help you. You can also ask mom and dad, mom and dad, is it important for you to have the best quality of life possible? Who's going to say no to that? <laughs> so ask them questions. Who in their right mind would say no yeah. to that? <laughs> And then ask them questions. Is it important for you to have a say in what happens to you as you age? Like where you're going to live, who's going to take care of you? Because if we don't put a plan together and you need care, you're going to just have to go into a facility. So let's start talking about this now. Otherwise, you're not going to have a say in it because just like when I was still an employee doing all the tours, parents didn't have a say at all because they're in the hospital. <laughs> So it is the it is the adult kids that are picking your facility. I know that's a cliche, but it's true. And so is it important for you to have a say in what happens to you as you age? Like where you live, how where you're going to get care. <clears throat> and you can also say, is it important for you, mom and dad, to be as independent as possible? Again, who's going to say no to that? Because that's part of our every most of us, that's our fiber, is we're all just trying to grasp on to 
the shred of independence and dignity that we have left as we age. And so when uh, these adult kids say, oh, mom and dad are just being stubborn and difficult. No, they're, they're just trying to, they're just trying to have as much dignity and independence as they can, because they know they're in a losing battle aging. We don't get better as we age. Right. So, I mean, no one is ignorant enough. They're in denial, but that's different than ignorant, (laughs) you know? And so if you're the parents, the moms and the dads listening to this podcast, and you want to have these conversations with your adult kids, and maybe you've tried this in the past and they're like, mom, we don't want to talk about it because that might jinx something from happening, which is absurd but there's a lot of superstition out there. So if you're the parents, you can say, again, same thing. We are in uncharted territory. There's things that we need to talk about as a family, but we need help. We need a neutral third-party person to help us facilitate these family meetings, to help us make sure that we have, you know, what we think is going to happen can actually happen. Because everybody assumes that they're going to age in place at home, but they're not realizing that when you need 24-7 care, That could easily be a twenty to thirty thousand dollar a month price tag with home care coming in. Plus, you got geriatric care managers. You're going to have all this traffic of physical therapists, home care companies, and that's those are the things that make aging in place at home undesirable and unmaintainable. You know, unless you have millions of dollars, then yeah, you could probably stay at home because money, money talks, right? Like you, when you have money, you have options, but most people just don't have millions of dollars to be able to spend in home care and then still have money to be able to then, you know, qualify financially to get into a quality care facility. So that's why we do what we do with, with care, right? And it's all customized planning based on what each family's specific variables are, because they're all a variation of the same thing, which is burned out family caregivers who are stuck. They don't know what they don't know. Most of them are working with frail elderly parents and a lot of them have dementia and they just don't know how to navigate any of that. And so that's why we do all of that white glove approach, or if they don't have the budget for that or the interest in that, then we have all sorts of do-it-yourself options where we teach you and then you take it from there. And the book is one of them. (laughs) The book is one of them. If you want to buy the book and then try to do your own aging plan from there, you you can, but it it also gets tricky because those family dynamics bubble up. And um, then it's really hard to facilitate your own family meeting. It's amazing how... A crisis, you know, your parents need more help, they need more care, and whatever fracture you've had in your sibling relationship or whatever, it's it just worse. becomes a cavernous hole. Because yeah. I was never close with my sister, and we managed to to muddle through pretty well for about two-ish years, you know, the end of dad's life, the beginning of mom's stay in memory care. Um, you know, I would update her after my visit, she'd update after my, you know, her visit, but then it was like, you know, we're just saying the same things and, you know, it's just like one of the, the, one of the mistakes I made, and it's, this is probably an older sibling thing is I would deal with crises and then it'd be over. And it's like, do I really want to just burden her with, oh, we had this minor issue and I dealt with it, but I'm just letting you know. So I didn't tell her things because it's like, I didn't really want to stress her out. Her in-laws lived with her. She has school-aged children. You know, like, does she really, you know, like, it wasn't life or death. It was just a, you know, like a a moment. Mm -hmm. And I look back, I'm like, this probably wasn't the right choice. I did it out of, you know, care, but I'm sure she thinks I was being sneaky and, you know, hiding stuff. (laughs) And even those simple little things, it's just like, it just fractured what little tenuous, you know, hold we had on each other for a little while. And now we don't talk to each other at all. So and that's it's like, so that's, I'm glad, I'm sorry that happened to you, but I'm glad you brought that up because 92% of our clients come to us in crisis mode where families are not getting along. We are not seeing them at their best at all. And 85% of those families require me to do family mediation with them. And that is one of the things that we talk about is what is your communication expectation? Do you want to know every time dad falls and he goes to the hospital? Do you want to know every time the doctor changes the medication? Do you, you know, what are you, what is everybody's expectations and what is actual feasible? Because if you're the primary caregiver and you're trying to balance work, life, your job, your own health, your own sanity, you know, you know, we need to figure out a system, a communication system that's going to make, for the most part, everybody as happy as possible. And always, always feel free to step in, you know, older siblings or yeah. other 
<laughs> so feel free to step in and help, you know? And so that's, that's why those family meetings that we facilitate are so important because these are topics that if families try to have them on their own, um, it goes sideways really quickly. And the other thing is when you're in uncharted territory, you don't know, like you don't know what kind of family agenda you should talk about. And you can't really put your own plan together in the first place. If everybody has a different idea of, well, mom's doing okay at home. And you're like, no, she is so not doing it. <laughs> she is not <laughs> doing okay at home. You know, so you, it's impossible for families to really honestly do their own family meetings and put a actual viable plan in place. Because if they don't know the difference between Medicare and Medicaid and assisted living and memory care and all that, they're, it's just helter skelter. And that's why they fail because they're trying to do this on their own. And I can promise you too, most parents, they absolutely do not want their kids' family relationships falling apart because of them. You know, so yep. it breaks their heart when they know that their aging, the caregiving toll has, and just family dynamics in general, has disbanded those adult kids' relationships. No parent wants that. And I've been with thousands because I worked in nursing homes and long-term care for, you know, over 18 years before I started Care Right. I can tell you those seniors that have those challenged family dynamics, they have brutal deaths because at the end of life, um, and that's a whole nother podcast, but that's, that's, um, end of life there, there's no turning back. Right. And so you've got to get the, you've got to get the, you got to clear the air we say, um, because adult kids don't have a chance to do it after mom or dad passes away. And once dementia hits and they can't communicate like that anymore, or they're in the dying process, you just don't want to lose that opportunity to, you know, make things right as much as you can with each other, but also with the parents. So that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I, I at least had a, I had a good enough relationship with my mom. She just was very, she was, she was an independent person who as the oldest sibling of four, you know, she was expected to watch the other kids. She, um, like my entire family graduated at 17 and a half so she wanted to go to design school. Her parents were like, absolutely not. You're not going to San Francisco. You're too young. And then, you know, she got married at 19. My dad liked to keep things in under, you know, his preferred control. So like she was always independent, but within somebody else's parameters. And that did not help with Alzheimer's. No. You know, she just, it was like, she just, just you know you you couldn't reason with her before and definitely not after alzheimer's and one of the mistakes my dad made was i was the healthcare power of attorney but he made my sister and i my sister who spends a hundred and fifteen percent of whatever dollars she makes um we were both the financial powers of attorney because he thought that would bring us together and force us to get along yeah like bringing money into in a situation like that is ever going to help people get along. Yeah. It did not. You yep. know, and it was, it was constantly a de delicate dance on eggshells around each other. I, I don't think she felt that way because she had no qualms about making statements that were highly untrue. Uh, my husband having been in banking for 20 years and then in real estate. So he's very familiar with financial contracts, et cetera. When he realized that my parents were going to need care, he contacted the family friend financial planner, which was probably a little outside of the appropriate maneuvers. But financial planner knew that he had the right intentions. It wasn't like, ooh, let me get a hold of in-laws money. No, because the money never went to us. It went to my parents' bank account so that we could pay the over $700 a day. This was in 2017 for, for oh. home care. Yeah, it's like... You think that's the cheaper route? No, you're vastly mistaken. That was 24-hour care for two people, 25 bucks an hour, mm -hmm. $28 an hour, it vacillated. And, you know, I couldn't be there 24 hours a day, so I had no idea what the the overnight people were doing. And uh, Talk about stressful. Having mom yep. in memory care was far less stressful. I didn't feel like I had to worry about those people nearly as much as I felt like I had to worry about the people I couldn't supervise, couldn't drop in on at 3 a.m. because I am not awake at 3 a.m. Well, I might be awake at 3 a.m. Yeah. to go to the potty, but <laughs> yeah. I'm not driving 20 miles to mom and dad's house to check up on the caregiver. 
So yeah. yeah, it's it's terrible. So I have a question based on somebody that I work with. She is taking care of an aging parent who is very lives alone, very lonely, very depressed. Thought they had she had convinced the parent that um, assisted living. She's actually a little beyond assisted living, but kind of convinced her that this was not a bad thing. A couple days later, parent has huge meltdown, refuses to even consider it. And she's at the point where it's like, I'm just waiting for something catastrophic to happen because doesn't want to force the parent into a living situation they think they don't want. But basically, and it's like, she doesn't really have a good option. So you have any suggestions for people that find themselves in this like, no matter what decision I make, it's going to make them unhappy. Yeah. So it's kind of a, a lot to unpack quickly, but um, <laughs> I don't the, ask easy well, questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the thing is that there's a lot of the, a lot of things at play. Number one is fear. Mm -hmm. My, you know, nobody's bucket list goal is to leave their house and move into a facility. And there's a lot of fear, you know, what do I do with all my stuff? You know, a lot of people in that, in that, because like, I took care of my mom with dementia for four years and my dad lives with me, you know, six months out of the year because I live here in Florida. But I know, you know, with clients and even with my own parents, the thought of, you know, they lived in this house for 60 years. What do we do with all of our stuff? So there, there's like this whole list of things that we go over when we have our strategy session with the adult kids on like, okay, I have your buy-in on putting a plan in place, but we need to like talk about strategy on tips on how to get mom on board. But also when it's the daughters or the sons, when families try to have these meetings on their own or like persuade their parents, it just does not always go very well because there's too much family junk that gets in the way. But when you have a neutral third party person, we have the ability to develop that rapport. We work as that advocate. Let me hear what you have to say, Dorothy, you know, mom, Dorothy and daughter, Sally, let me, you know, that's where some of that mediation comes in. And then, okay, what, what concerns you about leaving your house? <clears throat> you know, has, has, has she even been pre-qualified? Does she have enough money to get into that facility? Do they have an opening or do they have a four-year waiting list? You know, so there, there's a lot that that's to unpack with that, with just that one scenario. But, you know, if, if that person is listening, or if you want to connect them with us, with Care Right, we offer a complimentary, so it's a free to them, 30 minute zoom consult to just kind of unpack some of that and give some, some ideas and then go through what our services are and see if they are ready to invest in, in having better outcomes with a professional versus trying to wing all this all on their own. Yeah, I think there's too much emotion and history. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't even yeah. have to be negative. It's just, right. You that's know, why when families try to do this on their own, it just doesn't go well. And then that's when some of those relationships, like I said at the earlier earlier at the podcast, even the most close-knit families, this aging, caregiving, and dementia progression can put a wedge in those, re even in the most closest relationships. So you really do need to have a neutral third party help you navigate these conversations and put that plan in place so that they understand what care options are viable options and safe options for them. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. And we were going to talk about burnout, but it seems like care planning <laughs> well, that's the that's precursor say, to the burnout. You know, <laughs> that's why I say, that's why I said at the top of the podcast, with an aging plan, we can prevent caregiver burnout because an aging plan is making sure that you understand the diagnosis that you're dealing with. You understand what care options your loved one can afford. You know, if they have $5 million as, as assets, <laughs> that's a lot different options than someone who has 200,000 and they're 74 years old. You know, so when you have a plan, caregiving, aging, and dementia progression can be a more positive experience for everybody when you have an aging plan because you literally whip it out of your grab and go binder. You say, okay, oh, we need home care now. Here's the four or five different home care companies that we've already interviewed, we've talked to. Here's how much we know that they're going to cost. Here's how many hours we know that we have to commit to them. You know, and if mom and dad can't stay at home, we already know that they're on the waiting list of these two or three different care facilities because we did the care matrix for them. And that way you have that peace of mind of, okay, if staying at home is no longer feasible or safe, 
because we talk about in that aging plan, well, what's your stay at home aging in place bucket, you know, budget so that you don't then go through all of your money trying to stay at home because you made the promise <laughs> and now you can't get into any facility because now you went through all of your money and now you only qualify for a Medicaid facility. And what if there's not one in your area that has an open bed? And what if then, because you didn't know what you were doing or you acted too late, mom ends up in one facility and dad ends up in a different facility and they don't get to see each other again. Yeah, and that would be that's, rough. That's a shame. And it, yeah, that's no, that... what happens when you don't put a viable plan together. When you wing it, you know, we spend all of our life planning for everything else in our world, like where we're going to go to college, who we're going to marry, where we're going to live, where the kids are going to go to school, where we're going to retire, where we're going to go on vacation. So in God's name, why wouldn't we re why wouldn't we put a plan together for the most vulnerable time of our life when you're the most at the mercy of other people to take care of you? You know, it, it just doesn't make sense for you to wing it. So I think part of it is cultural, but I have a friend and I'm working on her. She doesn't want her children. She had three adult children, two young grandchildren. One's a baby. I, um, one's four. And she doesn't want her children taking care of her. She wants to live in her home forever, but doesn't want to talk about an aging plan. <laughs> and it's like, I'm going to work. on. I just told her I'm going to work on you because this is not, you know, there's no rational here. And yeah. she just laughs at me. And so I'm just hoping that just by the occasional poke jab, you know, kind of little, just like a little humorous, I'm going to work on you and then just kind of drop it, hoping that I can maybe get her wheels turning. You know, her husband well, is a huge planner. So hopefully. Well, and here's the thing. And then, and then I've got to close because I have a client to meet with. But <laughs> here's here's the thing. <clears throat> Here are, the, here are the mistakes that families make. Denial, thinking that they have more time. Like I said, the people that had major strokes last Thursday didn't wake up thinking they had that they were going to have a major stroke and their whole life just totally was devastated by that one action, right? Yeah, it wasn't on the to-do list. <laughs> it wasn't on the to-do list, but those life has its own agenda. So we have to be plan planned ahead for that. So there's all this denial of, well, I have more time or, you know, I can figure this out. I want, or I, this is a big one too, especially heading into this time of year. Well, I want to spend my last Christmas in my house and then we'll talk about it. Well, what if something happens at, you know, before Christmas time? And then that's when I say, when you're, when you don't have a plan in place and you need care, you will get into whatever facility has an open bed. And that does not mean that that's going to be a good fit facility. So, so people always think that they have more time to figure things out or put a plan in place. They're in denial and they certainly don't have their paperwork in order. You know, if, you know, all of us over the age of 18 should have our legal documents in order, our power of attorney, our living will, you know, because all those, all the people that we hear about on the news that had a car accident and died at age 30, didn't wake up that morning thinking, oh, I think I'm going to have a car accident and die and leave my family vulnerable. So you know, it's just, that's just how, you know, that's just how it is. And so we need to know that and be realistic that we all have a, a stamp on us on when it's our time. So why wouldn't we want to just make it easier for all of our family members and ourselves? Um, well, isn't the saying a, um, a failure to a plan is a plan for failure? Yep. <laughs> that's exactly what that is. Yep. I don't know. I don't know where that brain cell popped that one out of. But yeah, it's like we we want specific things, but then we just kind of like hope they're going to happen. And we know that's stupid. And right. we don't do that with other aspects of our life. So this has yes. been fantastic. Can you say the name of the book one more time? It was The Invisible yeah, Patient. The Invisible Patient, The Emotional, Financial and Physical Toll on Family Caregivers. You can buy it on Amazon, and my name is Anna Lee Kruger. So you can either buy it on Amazon, <clears throat> it's about $20 plus shipping and handling, or my book has its own website, and it's called invisiblepatientbook.com. The value of buying it on invisiblepatientbook.com is then I send you the book personally and then I have your contact information so we can follow up. Whereas when people buy off of Amazon, um, 
that we don't know, you know, they don't let us know who bought the book. That makes so, sense. Yeah. And, and you so, know, we, we need to support the small, small businesses versus Amazon mm-hmm. anyway. Yeah. Um, I wanted to also let them know that, um, just let me text him real quick. I'll call you in a minute. Um, the These other thing, yeah, well, I don't, cause he's in crisis. So I don't want him to think that like, I'm not going to call him right back. So anyway, um, the, when I wrote the book, I wrote it. Well, honestly, I was taking care of my mom who has dementia. And then two weeks after my mom fell, my dad had a, had a stroke. And so I was taking care of both of them at the same time. And so I ended up writing the book basically from like midnight till three in the morning when I was too exhausted to like keep going. And so, so the reality is that you'll see that I wrote the book. So there's all these chapters in it. So when I wrote the book, I was like, well, some people are going to read it cover to cover, which is fine because they are being they're probably more proactive and like, Hey, I want to read this book. Others are going to buy it in crisis mode and then just skip to whatever chapter is the one that hits home for them. And so you'll see that there is some redundancy because I didn't know what position my reader was going to be in when I wrote it. Um, so some are good. Some will read it cover to cover and then they're going to see there's some redundancy, but redundancy is okay because as a caregiver and all of this stuff is just so complicated, healthcare, dementia, caregiving, family relationships, all of that is so complicated anyway that you need redundancy to let it like sink in. So it's also on Audible for those that um, just don't, they, we just simply don't have time to read, but you want to listen to it. Um, it's also on Audible. So hopefully this was helpful. Hopefully everybody got three or four bits of nugget, like your grab and go binder, family meetings, talking about the what wins of aging sooner rather than later and putting a plan in place. And if all else fails, you've got my book that you can leverage or you can contact us through the Care Right Inc. website and set up a consult. So awesome. Well, the the book's <clears throat> website, the Care Care got care. Care, the, care. So the books, the books website is invisible patient book. Book. Dot com. And so, but if you want to book a consult about aging planning or crisis management or care advocacy or care coordination and family meetings, that's care right inc.com. And that's right is spelled correctly. So R I G H T. So I'll have those both linked in the show notes because I'm sure that we have sparked some, oh, I should think about that or I should deal with that or I never thought of that. I can feel all those yeah. thought bubbles popping up around us. Well, usually when I do a podcast or a webinar or a speaking engagement, um, usually like everybody comes up, you know, if it's on a webinar, they're always in the chat box or whatever. But if it's a speaking engagement, there's like this whole line of people because they're like, it seemed like you put this topic together just for me. And I'm like, well, that's because there's 300 million of you across the world. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anything that we talked about is, is critical for families to be successful. So, Well, I appreciate this. I could have used you guys back in 2017 <clears throat> when I was choosing in-home care within a 24-hour time span because the hospital was kicking dad out. I had yep. to pick a care home for mom. Um, yep. And like I said, they said she could keep her dog. And I'm like, here's money. You know, <laughs> not necess- yep. It worked out fine, but that's not the mo- method I would recommend. And, and that's just- not the norm either. Like, it's not the norm that it worked out okay. <laughs> Fortunately, I mean, I just got really good vibes from them. So, um, you know, when my sister went, she was like disgruntled mm-hmm. that the assisted living dining room tables all had stuff on them, including like little vase of flowers. Mm-hmm. memory cares tables were all bare that bothered her and i'm like logic you know like i am much more i'm a very emotional person but i'm also very logical and so obviously the logic part of me kicked in and i picked up on whatever it is i needed to pick up on because like i said they did a fantastic job with for three years even when my mother was a challenge so but mm-hmm. you know don't <laughs> don't don't rely on that a care plan my husband and i have talked about it we have one child she has a chronic illness and stress makes it worse. So, you know, she's not our fallback plan. <laughs> right. That makes it harder. So, you know, making these kind of plans is important. And it's not, 
it starts out a little ick, a little, eh, I don't really want to talk about this, but once you get through it, it's like, well, that was not that hard. So, and it's, well, a, it's the peace of mind that people need. Exactly. Because I can tell you the other thing too, is when, and, and then I do have to go, but when there's an only child, it is so stressful for them. They get really anxious and somewhat resentful because they're like, I have no, every single client that I have, that's an only child. They have all said the same thing and referenced the same thing that they're like, I have no one to bounce this off of. I I'm in this all by myself. They're even more isolated because they may or may not be married or their spouse may or may not be supportive. So, I mean, you know, everybody needs an aging plan, but just know that those that are singles, you know, only child, only children, they, they can be a tough, tough situation. And so I'm like, well, yeah, you are an only child, but at least you don't have four other siblings like <laughs> at your throat too, to argue with. So, so there's pros and cons, you know, to both, but definitely that, that does run through the minds of adult children is, oh my gosh, this is all going to fall on my shoulders. And even though they may not be in the best of health, as kids, we do step in when when we need to, whether whether our health is good or not, we we step in and we help we we come in and we try to come to the rescue and figure out what to do. But that's why a proactive aging plan is so much more cost effective and energy effective. And, and I guess that's one thing that your your listeners, you know, think about how would you rather spend the the rest of your time with your loved one? angry, resentful, you know, burned out as a family caregiver? How do you want to spend your time and your energy and honestly your money doing all these crisis trips back and forth and missing more work? Or would you rather just have an aging plan in place that you can just pull it out and be like, okay, here's what we're going to do now because we put this plan together. So it's up to people to decide how they want to spend their time and their energy and their money. And that's a good thought to leave them on because now yeah. that you're thinking about it, let me just say, once you've made these plans, it really is just an absolute stress off your shoulders that you didn't know you were carrying. So yeah. I appreciate this. I'm going to let you go to your client who needs you desperately. Yep. <laughs> and I appreciate all of this fantastic advice. And I know we'll be talking again. Very, yes, very good. Because you'll be on my podcast um, tomorrow. <laughs> yep. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Bye. 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 Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.